Thank you. Okay, we're recording now. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, should we get started? All right, so hi everyone. Welcome to our session on our, our curriculum change that matters, um, which is a curriculum to teach physicians behavior change strategies. I'm Stephanie Hooker. I am a clinical health psychologist and I'm currently a researcher at Health Partners Institute in Minneapolis. And I'm also affiliated with the University of, University of Minnesota, the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health. And I'm co-presenting today with um, my colleague, Dr. Michelle Sherman, and I'll let Michelle introduce herself. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's nice to see everyone virtually uh, on this forum. I hope you were able to get a little break and stretch. We have beautiful sunshine here in Minneapolis today. Hopefully you're able to find sunshine outside or in um, and during this conference. I know sitting, staring at Zoom for a long time can be a little tiring. So take care of yourself. If you need a restroom break or a stretch or a cuddle with a puppy or a child, take care of yourself today. But yeah, I'm Michelle Sherman, clinical psychologist and professor at the University of Minnesota of the North Memorial Program. Um, and uh, I'm happy to be able to be with you with Stephanie today. So uh, thanks so much. All right, so before we get started, just have to go through our disclosure. So we have no conflicts of interest for this program. Um, it was funded by two different uh, small grants, but one from the University of Minnesota Academic Health Center and the other from the National Center for Integrated Behavioral Health. And um, we were very fortunate to get this funding that really helped us kind of develop and, and um, evaluate our curriculum that I'm excited to share with you today. So the goals of our session are to just explain what brief interventions for health behavior change um, there are that can be implemented in primary care. Um, we're going to kind of describe our multi-component intervention to that um, we believe empowers physicians to address 10 common health behavior change topics. And um, we also ask you to consider how to integrate this type of curriculum and um, including our educational handouts and our templates into your family medicine residency program. So we'll talk about how to how you might implement it and make it work for you. So the goal for today is I'm gonna first just going to describe the curriculum, kind of our, our rationale for doing this curriculum. Um, we're gonna go through each of the components and then we're gonna have one breakout where we do um, ask you to you know, work with a small group and kind of walk through one of the, one of the handouts. And then um, we'll get back together and talk about the evaluation and implementation. So we have 90 minutes together today, so we're gonna um, power through. So first kind of thinking about why do we even care about addressing health behavior change? And we've kind of reflect on the quadruple aim, you know, which challenges our healthcare teams to work on these four goals, you know, to improve our population health, um, I got muted somehow. Yep, sorry, are you back on? Yep, I'm back on. Okay. Thank you. So, no problem. Um, so I, our, I, I was, as I was saying, was the quadruple aim that we're trying to focus on. We think our curriculum actually addresses all four of these areas. And so we are um, excited to share with, you know, one program I think that can maybe address several different goals. So, you know, the, one of the important things to think about is that, you know, about 40% of the variance in health outcomes are actually attributable to modifiable healthy lifestyle behaviors. These include things like activity, diet, sleep, uh, medication adherence, things that people have some control over, um, you know, but ultimately, a lot of people do not engage in all of these behaviors at, at once or all the time. And so we try to think about how do we address these modifiable risks that could contribute to health outcomes. And we think primary care is the perfect place to do this because primary care is a setting where we have some continuity, we see people through illness and health and can potentially make a big impact in trying to encourage these behaviors. And the great thing is there's been a lot of work in the last, you know, few decades trying to figure out what we can do in primary care settings. And so there are several brief interventions that have been found to be effective in primary care for health behavior change. 
They include things, you know, like um, brief interventions for alcohol use. They um, also, they, there are things like um, using pre prescriptions uh, or sorry, pres exercise prescriptions um, to encourage people to be, to engage in more activity. So there are several different interventions that are effective. Uh, the thing is that they haven't been put together in a comprehensive way to encourage people to engage in, to implement these in their settings. So, you know, we have all this evidence from different sources, but they're not implemented, you know, broadly across different primary care settings. The other thing that's important is that patients actually want us to talk about these topics. So one of these studies that demonstrated this is actually my colleague Leif Solberg did this project where he found that patients were actually more satisfied with their care when physicians talked about health behavior change. And in particular, in this case, it was smoking cessation. So patients, you know, you might think most patients don't want to talk about their smoking, but actually patients were more satisfied when people brought it up. And so that is an important to think about is that we often think patients don't wanna talk about things that they're not doing because maybe they feel guilty or ashamed, but ultimately they think this is the place that they should be talking about those issues. So, you know, despite we know that health behaviors are important, um, most primary care providers don't spend much time talking about health behavior change with their patients. We actually, um, there was a study that was done in the VA healthcare system that, that found that PCTs actually spend about 1% of their time with patients discussing preventive care and lifestyle. So this is a very small proportion of what they're doing right now and could be increased. Um, you know, ultimately they found that prior providers were spending most of their time in the EHR when they were in face-to-face -face encounters. Not surprising given how we, what we know about how our encounters go these days. But ultimately, this leaves a lot of space where we could improve and, and increase the amount we're doing. The other issue is that even during that 1% time when these topics are brought up, we are um, finding that the primary care providers are ultimately just explaining the risk to people about why, you know, they shouldn't be smoking or why they should be more active. And they tell people to do those things. Like, Quit smoking, you know, be more active, go do it. Um, and that's not the most effective strategy. <laughs> you know, just kind of encouraging people to, to change their behavior is not, you know, from our evidence from health behavior change doesn't really help that much. And we think a part of the reason that, you know, primary, primary care providers don't talk about this very much is they have very low confidence and low perceived effectiveness in what they're actually doing. So, you know, they don't know exactly how to help patients make those behavior changes. And when they do help them make those change or do bring it up, they don't think that patients actually change. You know, they see their patients, you know, from visit to visit and that, you know, that patient still needs to lose 20 pounds and that hasn't made any improvement. So I think that that kind of low perceived effectiveness and not really being sure about what to do kind of discourages primary care providers from actually talking about these issues with their patients. So we have a poll. Do we have ability to do polling, Michelle? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I, okay. I don't see um, any of that ability. So I know that they were checking on it, but it appears perhaps we'll just do it via the chat. Okay. Sorry, yeah, it didn't work out. So um, um, I couldn't get it going right that quick. So no um, do okay. chat. Okay, great. We'll just do it via chat, no problem. Great, great. good luck. Thanks. All right. So our first question is um, whether or not your family medicine residency has a specific curriculum to teach behavior change skills. And if yes, what do you use? So you could just say yes or no. Or if you say yes, you know, what do you use to address these issues in your residency? Stephanie, are you able to see the chat? Not easily, no. Oh, okay. Um, the answer, I'll just summarize then. The answers that we're getting are some yes, some no. Um, for most of the people who are saying yes, we're seeing MI, um, maybe ACT, uh, but motivational interviewing and BATE um, are um, maybe a little bit doing behavioral education, maybe seminars on MI with focusing on ambivalence and goal setting. 
brief intervention techniques, uh, CBT, MI, not a formal package. Um, those are the sorts of, of responses that we're getting. And five yeah. days, yep, MI. Great. Yeah, not a formal yeah, package. Yeah, you know, good. Yeah. Yeah, MI and BATHE are what our, our residency program used the most prior to our developing this curriculum. But, it, you know, MI is a, is a skill that needs a lot of um, support for people to learn how to do. And, and definitely over the course of a residency can, you know, be a whole another topic in itself. We try to incorporate MI principles into this training as well. So that's part of part of what we do. All right, so next question. How often do you think your residents talk about health behavior change with your patients? So we've got very frequently, most every encounter, frequently, not effectively, not often enough, 20% of the time, frequently, most encounters. <laughs> as much as I think, that was funny. Depends on the <laughs> residents. Pretty often, very often, mostly advice giving. Yeah, seventy percent. Okay, so some some very shortly for the majority of encounters. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. It sounds like most residents are talking about this, or at least our jobs are, are secure and that we're helping people <laughs> make sure that they talk about these topics. That's great. It's probably not the same in like actual practice, but residency is a great time for for them to learn these skills. All right, and what topic is most difficult for them to discuss? Obesity, people wrote weight, uh-huh. Weight and tobacco. <laughs> I love that. I want to believe it happens a lot, but we actually don't see it on video reviews. Isn't that true? So many things that they think, I know how to do agenda setting. I know how to do teach back. And then when we watch it, it doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. uh, switching to health and everybody approach. I love that. That's awesome. Unhealthy habits in children, opioids, substance use, suicidality, morbid question. Yeah, um, Dr. Brown, I agree. Do you want to quit talking? No. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> substance <laughs> use, trauma. Yeah. Good. Yeah some challenging topics in there for sure. I think we definitely heard obesity was one of the most difficult topics from our residents too, because they worry about you know the stigma associated with bringing up obesity. And I think that could go for a lot of other issues too, like substance use or even you know suicidality. So there's a lot of topics that can be very difficult and for uh, residents to bring up. And That's some of the pediatric participation. obesity. That's uh, it's such a, a challenging thing we encounter all the time. I just want to comment that our presentation today um, is actually focused pretty much exclusively on adults. Um, so although some of the topics and ideas and general constructs uh, would apply to people all ages, we really are focusing on adults in our presentation today. So I just wanted to comment that although certainly pediatric obesity, we really struggle with that at our program as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's mainly because Michelle and I are both adult psychologists and we just didn't have the expertise to do the development of children um, modules, but if other people have that expertise and want to take that on, we are right there and we'll help support you. <laughs> um, yeah, if you don't mind, I want to add one more thing, um, and that is truth in advertising. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm not a health psychologist. Um, Stephanie is a health psychologist. And so I uh, was really fortunate that she came to our North Memorial Residency Program to do postdoctoral fellowship. And upon arriving, she really helped me uh, appreciate that um, we were doing much more kind of pure clinical psychology and less health psychology sort of things, which is an, really an impetus for developing this curriculum. Furthermore, and as I look at some of the pictures, I, I know some of you and um, um, uh, some of you, I'm sure are health psychologists have a lot of health tra uh, training. Some of us don't. I went to graduate school a long time ago and I did not specialize in health psychology. So although we're talking today about helping our residents, which of course we're here in this role of, of teachers and educators, also as we provide clinical work, I wanna have on our hat as therapists as well, um, because all these tools, interventions, all this sort of stuff today, we can use as well. And at least for me, I'll tell you, um, someone who's been a psychologist 20 some years, but I have found benefit myself in using some of these skills in my own psychotherapy. So uh, I think both for our teacher hat and our own clinical work with our patients. 
with these resources, although again, they're framed for residents, physicians, they can be used by all disciplines. Thank you, Michelle, for reminding us that this is not just for residents, it's for all of us. And even for our allied health professionals, I know we have trade, trainees in our clinic that are, you know, pharmacy and other, you know, even our med students or other trainees that come in. So a lot of people could benefit from this. It's great. There's some really insightful comments here in the chat. Stephanie wrote, residents seem to be at a loss of what to do once they confirm a patient has a struggle with something that's not good for their health. They come into residency with an idealistic view. They'll educate their patients. This is one thing that they struggle with is how to help them with health behaviors. Um, how to navigate that space um, and the worry about shaming patients. So yeah, I agree. It's a great observation. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so because of all these challenges, we decided to create this curriculum and we made it free for anybody who wants to download it. So this is our website, changethatmatters.umn.edu. I encourage you to look at the website. Um, you'll actually need to look at the website for a part of this because you have to download <laughs> at least one brochure during this presentation. So you feel free to open it up and take a look. Um, but that was part of this is that we wanted to share this, this knowledge and this uh, work that we've done with other people because we realized there weren't a lot of comprehensive curricula out there to teach these skills. And the other thing I want to note is that with the new family medicine milestones that are, I guess, now in practice, right? Um, identifying and working on health promotion is one of the newer milestones. And I think we have a competing session that also talks about the milestones at this moment. So you get a little bit of milestones here. Um, but I think it's important that this is going to be a, a skill that our residents are going to be, you know, have to track and make sure that they're improving on. So I, it's also a good impetus for implementing something like this in your curriculum. So our team, we really um, want to emphasize this was a team of, uh, that really helped us pull this all together. So Michelle and I are co-leads of this project, but we have our colleagues uh, represent lots of different disciplines. And so, and we have um, our family medicine colleagues, Ann Doring, Casey Justison, and Andrew Slattengren, and Jason Rico, um, and the, but, you know, and Sam Na actually. Um, two of them were residents and the other were faculty. Um, we also had our pharmacy, um, Jean Moon and Katie Loaf is our, our nutrition public health expert. And Mark was our, um, our public health resident or first or administrator research assistant person helped us do a lot of this development. So this was really a team-based approach. And we tried to take all of our expertise from our different disciplines and try to in integrate that into this curriculum. So, you know, obviously we, Michelle and I came from it from a psychology perspective, but we, you know, made sure that this is going to work for a resident in a clinic by, you know, talking to family medicine experts about what, you know, what is useful and what works for them. So. That's important for us is that we use this interdisciplinary group. And so here are the 10 different topic areas. And so we actually started with six um, health behaviors that were kind of top topics that were brought up most commonly. So that included alcohol use, medication adherence, sleep problems, healthy eating, smoking, physical act and physical activity. And then we got so much feedback from residents that they wanted more behavioral health experience and, and help. So that's where we added chronic pain, depression, stress, and social isolation. And so those were the topics that um, the residents really said, we need help figuring out how to address these two. And so that's how we ended up with the 10. And I really want to point out that change that matters, the name of the curriculum is intentional and that the mattering part is about values. And so we really emphasize throughout the curriculum to encourage residents to talk about what's important to the patient, where does the patient find meaning in their life, and how do you use that to help them make that change. And so that's my area of research and focus has been on, you know, the, the association between meaning in life and, and health behaviors and health outcomes. And so I tried to in, in incorporate that into this curriculum as much as we could. So thinking about what, what is that, what does that mean? You know, values are the things that we just find most meaningful or important to us in life. Um, for, and that's different for every person. You know, for some people, they might get a lot of meaning out of family or friends and relationships. 
Other people get meaning out of their work or out of, you know, um, contributing to society, volunteering. Um, there are a lot of different things that people find meaningful, spirituality, um, education, you know, and so whatever it is for that person, it doesn't really matter the content as much as it is helping them connect with that sense of meaning, where do they find it. And so, you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with different values-based interventions, um, you know, ACT being one of the most um, popular values-based interventions, but, you know, they really ask people to reflect on what is valuable to them to encourage them to engage in those valued activities. And so when we talk to residents about why do people want to, you know, quit smoking, like, getting down to the, the real reason is maybe they realize that smoking is impairing their ability to engage with, you know, the things that they find most meaningful in their life. And if they quit, they could, you know, be healthier, they can engage with those things, and then they would ultimately be happier or feel like their lives have, lives have more meaning. So that's really where we try to make that connection, encourage the residents to help those patients make that connection because that will help people, you know, maintain those changes over time. And that's the goal. So each module has three components. Um, you know, so we have the topic, which may be eating, for example. And then there is an interactive patient brochure. There is an EHR template, and then there's a didactic lecture. Um, the EHR template, there's actually two different templates. There's a documentation template and an EVS template. Um, so, or after visit summary. And so we'll go through all of these components in more detail, um, just to overview that there are three parts. And so here's just some examples of the patient handouts. So um, they're uh, colorful. We had a graphic designer that worked with us to help kind of um, put our interventions into these, you know, small, you know, I get, it's just a, it's a brochure, one page front and back, you know, of, you know, guiding people through the intervention. Um, they are available in English and Spanish, which is great. We don't have a lot of Spanish speakers in our clinic. We actually have a lot more Hmong speakers, but we um, found that patients who are Hmong don't usually read. So we didn't think it was useful for us to, at this point to translate into Hmong. But um, Spanish was obviously, it's another very common language in our country. So we thought we'll just go with Spanish as the first translation. Um, important thing that we think is that these are interactive. So they're not just a handout you hand to a patient and say, here, take this home, here's some tips. It actually is supposed to help guide and facilitate a conversation. And so it's supposed to be used during the visit as part of, you know, a conversation between the resident and the patient. And we really try to draw about, uh, on evidence-based strategies. So we didn't make up all these interventions. We used what we know was effective for each of these areas. We looked at the literature, drew upon our expertise, um, especially in short interventions that can, that can be used in primary care. And we also added the values components and making sure that, that that's an emphasized um, and helps people identify pro and problem solve barriers and set specific goals. So there's a, um, a walk through a couple examples of how we do this in our curriculum. So for example, here is the sleep handout. Um, so this front page is just um, the front of the brochure, which is on the right-hand side. Um, on the left-hand side, there's a, a tips page. So all of our brochures have just kind of these um, general tips for things that help with that area. Um, and on the back, there's a specific area where they can write their goal for the week um, in a big block letters. And there's usually um, some kind of encouragement or, or tip right underneath that to kind of encourage people to keep going. On the inside of the brochure, this is really, you know, where you see there's space for patients to write. And we say patients to write because we do want the patient to be the one that's writing on this. We don't want the physician to do it. So we, you know, we encourage this to be a conversation, but the patient, we want the patient to engage. So by writing down on the, on, on the brochure. Um, you know, so you see here, there's just a little bit of information about why sleep is an important, you know, habit. And then in, this takes you through the brief behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is ultimately just sleep restriction and um, sleep scheduling. We encourage a little bit of stimulus control, um, you know, keeping, 
you know, phones and other things out of the bedroom. Um, but the main thing is about scheduling a regular wake up time and, and a bedtime that are consistent and, and getting people into those habits. So here's another example. We have a, our depression handout um, and we just, we call it improving our mood because obviously sometimes people just we don't need a mood boost and they don't necessarily have like major depressive disorder, but we, we see a lot of people in our clinic that have major depressive disorder. Um, so again, it's kind of the same. You see the, the cover and then the tips page and a goal on the back. Um, this one also has the suicide hotline. Um, we thought that was important to include on this one just in case people needed that number. Um, on the inside, so this takes you through um, like a values-based behavioral activation exercise. So again, it's not CBT for just depression. It's something that a clinician or a physician could do, you know, encouraging people to engage with valued activities as part of their um, treatment for their depression. So it's, you know, taking them through um, talking about the depression spiral just a little bit about how you can get into these habits and that makes you feel worse. And so we got to break that spiral by engaging in behavioral activities. So there's just some suggestions for things that people might choose for activities that would be helpful. Um, but we obviously encourage individualized goal setting, like pick an activity that works for you. And then um, helping them think about, you know, um, what are valuable activities for their time and how to make that work. So that's the patient handouts. Um, like I, I mentioned, there are also two electronic health record templates for each module. So there's a documentation template and an ABS template. The documentation template is really there just to guide through the, the intervention. Um, we find that we don't want our residents to stare at the EHR while they're doing this. Obviously, we'd like them to make eye contact with their patient and have a conversation. But sometimes like interns and, and other people who are just not as familiar with doing this need a little bit more guidance. So the documentation template guides them through some brief assessment questions, like these are the things you should ask about, and also gives them um, tips on how to do the goal setting part of it and, and move through the intervention. Um, we started out, they were very long, but we ended up shortening them after getting feedback from the, from the residents that they wanted them to be really short. And so they're, they're still kind of long for our documentation template, in my opinion, but they, um, they're much shorter and we have a lot of um, smart phrase, um, you know, drop down things that, that can make it easier. So they're not typing in there all the time. Um, the ABS template is just something, you know, you can put in the after visit summary that kind of reminds the patient about their goals. I think it's good to have that in multiple places so that, you know, it's on the brochure, it's on their ABS, they remember why they're, what they're doing, and then they can come back. Um, and then the tips are also included on the ABS template. So this is just an example of one of those documentation templates. For, for, this is for the depression module. Um, you know, where we kind of ask them to think about what are the current symptoms and where it says list of symptoms, that's something that in our, in our record we have as, you know, a drop down box. So they're not actually typing that in, they're just kind of selecting from a, a list. Um, we have, you know, current stressors, other psychiatric concerns, um, what treatments are they using for their depression, and just thinking about barriers to behavioral activation, which is our, our intervention and reasons the patient wants to improve their mood. And then the plan. So, you know, what's the patient specific goal? Are you doing any other kind of referrals? Um, BFM is our clinic. So behavioral, are they getting referred to, you know, a behavioral health therapist? Um, are they going to an outside mental health facility, seeing psychiatry, doing, you know, um, intensive outpatient therapy, things like that. And then this is the ABS. So again, it's like today we talked about ways to improve your mood. This is your goal. We're going to follow up at your next appointment. And these are just some other tips. So very short. Can I ask a question about your documentation? Sure. I, I'm, I'm curious to know. So first of all, I, I just sort of broadly think that this is all amazing. I was already, um, I what got hit to this from the SDFM Connect, like a number of things ago. And so I think this is, I've already looked through it quite a bit. Great. I'm curious about, do you like enforce or mandate the use of this in any way? Or do you just make it available? It's just available. Yeah. We don't. And so then do you have a sense of how many residents are, are using this? 
That's a good question. We try to track this. There's something called a smart text in Epic where we were encouraging the residents to, to download it from there. But residents didn't know how to access that and they just, they're so much more familiar with dot phrases. Um, so we don't know. I think that the documentation templates are probably used a lot less than the patient handouts because the patient handouts are printed, they're available in the rooms. Um, we just, we have this there for, in case they want it. I, Michelle, I don't know if you have any, get more feedback on that. You know, as Stephanie alluded to, part of this is teaching. And so we think actually the first few times they may kind of use them more, but then they internalize and figure out maybe kind of like suicide assessment, right? And we teach them templates, we teach them how to do it, and then they personalize it. So I see it more in interns than in second and third years, which is fine in my opinion, if they're kind of learning how to do this sort of stuff. So um, I, I do see a lot of notes and I certainly see these templates sometimes, um, but they're also more, we conceptualize them as a learning uh, thing for them to start. Um, but yeah, great question. Yeah, that's a great I, mean, I, I, I In my program, I um, precept in one of the clinics with um, every resident um, throughout, you know, the year. And um, I was sort of thinking about having them, you know, creating that this is would be like an expectation. I've been thinking about this before today, but like that it would be an expectation that they would include this in their in their notes and and for, for me to sign off on. Um, just as for to, to that point exactly, that's exactly what I was thinking of is that not necessarily that they would start using this routinely, but that they would have to satisfy each of these areas by asking the questions that would just get them kind of in asking the questions. Yeah, uh, that's a really interesting idea. I'd be curious, like if you do do that, let us know how it goes. So I think that's good information for us from an implementation standpoint. Um, okay, and the last piece of the curriculum is the didactic lectures. And so we have PowerPoint slides that are available. Um, you know, Michelle and I and our colleagues created them, you know, where we generally go over these, the brief overview of the scope of the issue. Um, there are different uh, guidance for assessment strategies. We talk about just what are the general evidence-based treatments for that area. And then we go over the specific tools that, you know, with the EHR templates and the patient handout. We do a structured role play, um, which you see the asterisks. Um, this is a, an area of contention with residents. Um, some of them find it valuable, other people hate role plays. Um, we think it's really important, at least to practice, to start saying these things out loud because it's really hard to try to do it for the first time in a room with a patient. Um, so we encourage this as part of our our learning. Um, and also in all of the didactics, there are, um, you know, strategies for responding to common challenges, and then just some resources for further learning. And so, you know, all of these PowerPoint slides are available, you're welcome to kind of take them and modify them for your own purposes. Our curriculum, um, the way we did our didactics at, um, you know, our program has a behavioral health didactic every month. And so we just implemented one per month. Um, this was um, 60 to 90 minutes of time that we're, we're allotted. And that's kind of how we implemented it. So we are going to encourage some structured role play. Um, we're going to do some breakouts. We're going to put you into groups of three or four people. And we just ask that you um, pull out up the modules from the website. Again, it's changethatmatters.umn.eu. Um, in the group, you can just pick a patient handout to talk about. Um, we kind of ask that if you're going to try this as a role play, one person plays the physician, the other the patients, the others as the observers, and just kind of walk through it together. I mean, this is not, we're not judging, we're not trying to see who's the best at <laughs> doing this. We just want you to kind of start thinking about like, if your residents were doing this type of role play, together? Are they, you know, how would you coach them through it? How was this? How would this work? Just so you can kind of get the feel for how this might work. And then we're going to sort of give you 15 minutes to do this. Um, so we'll reconvene at, in 15 minutes, we'll debrief, and then we'll talk about um, the evaluation of it in our, in our program and then how you might implement it in yours. So yeah, please be sure just to pull up the website. Something that's also important is that on the home page of the website, we have, you know, links to each behavior with the materials within it, but there's also a place you can do a zip drive and download everything. 
So if you want the entire curriculum, you don't have to download each individual piece. Um, so feel free to do that if, if that's helpful for you. Um, I'm going to put you in breakout rooms now. It will let you know when it's almost time to come back. Um, and, you know, just like with residents, sometimes role plays feel a little bit funny, particularly via Zoom. But we find that actually, if you actually get in there and try, you know, pick one of the 10 topics that interests you. See what you think. We want to come back and talk about it. See what you think. Would this be helpful for your program? And then not only will we talk about our evaluation of the curriculum, but we'll talk about kind of what's been tough for us in terms of things we learned. And uh, it's not all easy. Uh, some of it's been challenging things to, to learn. And so how, what we learned, what are some specific tips for implementation? So we do hope that you stay with us. So uh, I will uh, assign this now and then we'll look forward to hearing how it goes. All right, so let's debrief a little bit. Um, so first we'll just kind of ask which topic your group picked. If you can feel free to put this in the chat so you can kind of get an idea for what topics people picked. We've got eating, alcohol, pain, sleep, activity, Good, so a variety of different topics. Alcohol, someone's trying to convince me to drink less, could. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's just kind of talk about how, how did it go? You can put your answer in the chat or if you feel comfortable and you wanna kind of talk about it, you know, to the group, you're free to, you know, unmute yourself and, and go ahead and, and chat. This is Jen Nelson Albi. Uh, our group did the one on sleep, and um, I was able to actually pull up the brochure on a side screen so we could actually walk through it. And um, I just really appreciated how practical it was, um, both with a lot of um, hints and tips, but then also, you know, actually engaging them and coming up with strategies and could see where you talked about the values piece in terms of what do you think, uh, what was it, what would help you, or why do you think you're not sleeping? I forget now exactly what the question was, but <laughs> um, just a really, a lot of nice, really uh, prompts uh, in terms of questions and things to go through with patients. And it was, could, I could see it being pretty quick, you know, not taking forever. You certainly fit mm -hmm. within one um, session or yeah. appointment. Yeah, that's definitely the idea. We don't want these to feel like they're too long that you can't fit them into a primary care visit. So thanks for sharing, Jen. I think it was nice to have that structure too, you know, uh, as I was thinking about like, it, it was, we also did the healthy eating and it was very heavily focused actually on MI techniques, but in a very succinct and structured way for, you know, like you were saying earlier, Stephanie, about training residents to do this over the course of three years and sometimes you teach and you teach and you teach and it doesn't necessarily get implemented but having some kind of structure and handout like this is a tool you're providing them which i think goes a long way with the structure yeah yeah i would agree with that residents i think love when it's short and sweet and have something specific they can work off of i think it really helps with their confidence level um you know, my, I was very fortunate. My patient was very sophisticated. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> the only challenge I could see if I give these handouts to residents is I could see some of them really defaulting to, ooh, there's information on here that I can provide to my patient. Let me tell them how apples and grapes are good. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, which is just not effective and kind of what I'm, usually it's not effective unless that is, there's a deficit in knowledge that the patient has regarding healthy food, really highlighting the, the areas that are not about providing information, but rather eliciting from the patient. Yeah, that is definitely a default. I think residents fall into is like, if they have knowledge about something, they love to share it. And so I think it's important to emphasize that this is really about making the patient talk <laughs> and encouraging the patient to think about their own goals and what they wanna work on versus you telling them what to do. 
Yeah, uh, we'll get into evaluation in a few minutes, but one of the best compliments that Stephanie and our colleagues and I have received is um, that some of our graduates want to go on and use them. And they come back and say, could we use these in our programs? And then, of course, we say yes. You know, they're all free and available for anyone. But I think that having something to hand a patient that they can hold on to, they can take home with them, they can look at is really um, what I'm hearing a lot of you say that, that folks really like. It's tangible. Um, it's personalized. It's not just something off the internet. It's something that they write their goals on working with their provider uh, in a visit and uh, things like that is some of the things that we hear from our residents that they especially like and seems consistent with what many of you are saying. All right. We, uh, I didn't, I, what I liked, actually, I didn't have the, bro, I only had the brochure and I was the resident teaching, but I definitely liked the idea of having the patient have the form in front of them so they could see and we could work through it together. And then they would leave with a completed sheet on, on understanding their triggers and stuff. So, and if uh, I definitely agree, letting the patient fill in the, the brochure as we go along would be, would be a good thing. Uh, the alcohol one, I went into a little more motivational interviewing instead of just going right to the scale. So I did the pros and cons and things mm -hmm. like that. But um, I think I, I picked up your, uh, your information from the health psychology listserv a couple about a month ago. So I've been using it already. So thank that's you. great. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, we've definitely been trying to get the word out. So, you know, this this is probably, um, you know, later in the game since we've started doing our kind of dissemination activity. So it's great that some of you have already gotten these resources on other places. You know, and this is kind of just an opportunity to talk about how to implement it in your setting. So. The other thing I would just highlight that um, has emerged that we didn't anticipate, honestly, but has been kind of a nice thing that's emerged um, is I don't know how it works in all of your programs, but for us, the interns, have to precept with the physician before the patient can leave. And the physician has to have, lay eyes on the patient. I'm, I'm guessing that's uh, pretty consistent. So what we've actually found is at times, um, well, a couple of things happen. One is um, the resident may engage the patient in discussion with whatever the topic is, and then have the patient keep working out while they're out precepting. Because it gives them something to do with that time. And they come back and kind of continue the discussion and goal setting. So that's kind of a nice thing. The other thing that has emerged again spontaneously is, I don't know about in your clinics, but at times we have some delays that maybe residents are running behind or, you know, thing, patients come early or things like that. You know, it happens in different, in different settings, uh, situations. Um, I'm meaning to let someone in here. Um, but um, in those situations, at times the patient will already grab several off of the shelf <laughs> and they're looking at them. And so it can provoke a conversation that maybe wouldn't have happened. I had that not occurred. So those have been some of the things that we've actually also found that happen spontaneously uh, that bring up the conversations and hopefully a less threatening way that you need to, you know, <laughs> um, increase your activity or you need to quit smoking or things like that. Um, other ways of having those conversations emerge is nice and particularly using that precepting time. Can I, can I, um, make a comment about that, Michelle. The, I, I'm glad that you brought up precepting. Going back to the earlier question that you guys had about how often residents discuss behavior change with their patients, I, I, I feel like, you know, educating residents is, is a, um, you know, it's obviously an important part of this job, but I, I some of the, I, I, I have been noticing in my own work that, like, if we can get to the preceptors, that it's, some of these things are more likely to actually happen, because it's really, like they want to, you know, they're going to go through their visit in a way that they feel is going to satisfy the preceptors so that they can come back and say, this is what we did. And because these are the things that the preceptors are asking them to do or want to make sure that they did. And um, I, it strikes me that sharing some of this stuff with preceptors in your clinic is probably important so that they're the ones who are saying like, okay, but tell me what, how did you talk to them about their smoking or whatever? We couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and so actually many of our collaborators on creating this curriculum are preceptors of our clinic. <laughs> so they've been invested in that way, but we couldn't agree more that the, all the community preceptors, and we made packets of the new stuff, all the new community preceptors, all of our new uh, attendings and things like that. We give them kind of an orientation to it. Um, we also have literally sitting at our residence table, a thing of, of all the pamphlets sitting right there. So if like um, psychologist, postdoc fellow or I are sitting there, we say, here, have you thought about using the smoking handout or whatever else? 
Um, so yes, um, it's, you know, like with anything, right? It's behavior change, right? It takes um, all of the skills that we know about really integrating this into a new curriculum. So we couldn't agree with you more that they're an essential piece of it. Um, Mark brought up a great question. Okay, Steph, do you wanna comment? I just responded to Mark in the chat, but Mark asked if we had thought about making an app. And I just, I said, yes, we've definitely considered it. Um, but we, we start with the low tech version first. We, you know, I'm sure many of you have, have clinics like ours where we, we're in an underserved community and, and a lot of our patients don't necessarily have access to, you know, like the internet all the time or, you know, that most, a lot of people have smartphones now, but um, so we start with the kind of the low, low tech version first. And, but we do think it could be helpful to um, integrate this in either a web platform or, or an app. And that's something we're considering for the future. Should we move on to just kind of talking about implementation and evaluation? Okay. Let me get back on my screen. There we go. So I'll hand it over to Michelle. Great. Thank you. We really appreciate the comments in the chat and the comments and um, our emails are here and very easily available. We'd love to continue the conversation. And it truly touches me, honestly, that people um, find this helpful and can use it to share with their residents and patients. It makes us very happy. So thank you for the kind words, <coughs> excuse me. So Steph and I are both very much, um, you know, it's nice to create something, but we have to see if this sort of thing makes any difference. I mean, certainly you can Google smoking cessation and there are crap loads of things out there. So, you know, we don't want this to be just another thing out there that we don't know if it really makes a difference. Um, again, I think that the three things that make our curriculum unique are number one, the focus on using all evidence-based interventions, two, the grounding and act and kind of focus on, on meaning, and three, that it's really an integrated uh, curriculum with all the all these components. So the didactic part, the handouts, um, and the kind of resources for in the visit and after visit summary. So those are some of the ways we think this is unique. Um, and so we really did want to see, you know, is this making a difference? At this point, it's only really been formally um, implemented some evaluation at our one clinic. Um, but this is what we've done. So we've done a mixed methods project uh, with the three following samples. Uh, one, we had an expert panel, and then we did individual interviews and self-report surveys with both residents and patients. And we'll tell you what we found. Next slide. Um, we asked um, 11 field medicine resident faculty, both physician and behavioral health from across the country to evaluate our pamphlets for us. We use the patient education materials assessment tool uh, from the AHRQ, uh, which gives us uh, ratings on two variables. Uh, one is understandability. Now, did this thing make sense? Did it hang together? Uh, and actionability. Did it empower the reader to take steps and, and do things, and actually make positive changes in their behavior? And we had some open-ended sort of sentences. Um, we had each reviewer review three of the handouts and provide open-ended feedback, and this is what we found. As you see on the left-hand column are the different topics. And here are the medians for understandability and actionability uh, for the 10 different brochures. Overall, they were um, quite positive. Um, the, the stress one was a little bit lower, um, but overall we were relatively pleased uh, that people seem to have positive ratings um, in their evaluations of the understandability and actionability. Next slide. Yeah. I would just say the scales on uh, zero to 100. So 100 is a perfect score. So that we're very pleased overall that many of our, our handouts got really high ratings. Um, did you say literacy level? Yes, they were all, um, was it fifth grade, I think, Stephanie? Uh, between fifth and eighth grade, probably. Uh, yes, great question, we did. Um, yep. More importantly, we asked for uh, open-ended feedback from folks what they thought, and this is basically what we heard. Um, particularly, uh, as you all say, I'm looking at a lot of MI here, right? Uh, CBT. Uh, we were very intentional about trying to reflect diversity. It was something we really worked hard on for any concrete recommendations, simple language, interactive. Uh, we had some very helpful feedback in terms of some clarifications, some word changes. And then, as I shared, we're being transparent with you today and telling some things that we feel proud of and some things that we would like to continue to improve. And one of them we heard from several folks is that, well, you know, Michelle and Stephanie, this is nice, but behavior change is something that keeps going over time. It's normally, sometimes quitting smoking, but normally it's an ongoing sort of effort and change. And so 
wanting to increase our message of keep trying even when it's hard. Um, you know, this is kind of a behavior initiation intervention. There's also a need for maintenance. And that's really not what our curriculum is focused on. And so that idea of thinking about the longer term journey was some helpful feedback we got. So we we're very grateful to our reviewers uh, to give us this helpful feedback. Um, as alluded, we also interviewed, I had a research assistant, next slide, uh, please interview. Oh, I'm sorry, here's a quote. I like the brochure, it was interactive. It wasn't just read this and go do it. I like the approach of here's some information, let's figure out what works for you. And they found it was helpful, so that's great. Okay. As we said, we interviewed our residents um, and we did some qualitative analysis and these are some of the themes that we found. A sense of increased confidence and self-efficacy. I know how to help people with these things. I really like this idea of wanting to plant a seed or make a difference, feels more confident and sort of less tied to outcomes. It's an ongoing process that was nice. What is the patients I'm hearing empowered? It gives them some ownership and they feel they can control and change something, which I really like. Certainly something that we all try to do, right? And working with our patients, helping them feel empowered. Next. We also interviewed patients. Um, some of the things we heard from them were similar to what the PCP said. They felt empowered to take ownership of their own health. Someone said about the sleep brochure, you know, there's stuff I can do before we jump to meds. It's refreshing to know there's stuff I can do rather than just take a pill. Patients thought that the pamphlet sparked reflection, helped with setting goals and tracking progress. And someone gave a quote about um, how writing things down, we all know this, right? How writing things down can help with motivation. Put on your fridge, you can look at it and see how you're doing. So um, next slide. Overall, we thought that the, the patients and the um, providers and expert panel gave some really very positive and helpful feedback. How we wanna spend the rest of our time is chat a little bit about the kind of tips on implementation kind of expenses um, and then have time for kind of comments or questions or reactions from all of you. A few tips for us uh, that we learned and I really want to emphasize that on the website there's something called implementation toolkit that goes in much more detail of what we're going to say right now. So this has actually all the steps, what to do, how to do them and all these sort of things. So um, really encourage you to check that out if, if you're wishing to implement or adapt this. You know, we also fully recognize that every residency program is different. You may not have a monthly behavioral health didactic thing like we do. You know, your precepting may end up different. Everyone program is different. I, I appreciate that. So we are totally happy with you adapting this to meet your needs and whatever's going to work for you. As Stephanie mentioned at the beginning, actually both our PD and our APD have both been involved in creating this curriculum, which has certainly been very helpful to have support from the top. Identifying site champions certainly can include us. We think it's helpful to have interdisciplinary team members as well. One thing is this thing about didactics. So we actually, Stephanie and or I, at least co-presented, if not solely presented most of the topics. We tried like for the healthy eating one, we had our dietitian do it with us, medication adherence, we had our pharmacist do it with us, um, physical activity, we had our sports medicine uh, faculty physician do it with us. So we really believe it's important to present with your colleagues when possible. Realizing that people are busy, I appreciate that, but. The curriculum's done, the PowerPoint's done for you. I mean, you make your own twists and make it better. Um, but even we heard from the residents, they liked it when it wasn't just a behavioral health person talking. This is not just a behavioral health issue. Okay, this is something that we're all working in together. And it showed, it gave credibility to the curriculum when the faculty physicians co presented. We also had residents co present, I will say, you know. Yeah. Residents who really felt passionate about topic, um, you know, we had a couple of residents who really were interested in obesity prevention, and so they talked about healthy eating with us, and it was a great opportunity for them to dive in a little bit to the literature as well. Exactly. Very, yeah, totally. Um, obviously, we made EHR templates. Everyone has their own, <laughs> so adapt as you wish. We think having them, you know, available so you can see them is important in your resident room or wherever you do your precepting in the patient exam rooms. Um, as I'll note in a moment, we also have posters and that's also free on our website to download. We have those on every, all 36 of our exam rooms. Um, and um, again, I'll show that in a moment, but that can spark conversation as well. We're just trying to have things visible. Uh, and as um, I think it was Dr. Brown who mentioned, it's, if it's just us talking about this, it's not going to fly. So like in our interdisciplinary team meetings, in our precept, integrated care, didactics, all these things, finding times and opportunities to review them. 
even for example, if you go through all the 10, you know, monthly things, then we do like a refresher. So even if I'm talking on some other topic, I'll say, let's do a five minute refresher on physical activity. Let's do a five minute refresher on healthy eating. So repetition, right? Incorporating other stuff that we do. Um, when we're talking about a complex patient in our integrated uh, team meetings, consistently encourage them to use these resources is just essential. Uh, next slide, please. So there on the right is the poster. Um, again, that's totally free. You're welcome to download it and, and put it in your office or your, wherever you'd like. It might work for you. Expenses. Um, so it is all free. So please use them whatever you wish. Um, it is there as you've already hopefully found. So where people have asked, can you reproduce the comment, the handouts? Yes, definitely. You can do black or white or color. We do say they look prettier in color, um, but of course that's more expensive. Uh, so yes, it's all available and free. We did pay for handout holders in the exam room and if you wanna pay for posters, but really that's it. There really aren't any other expenses involved. So we hope it's a relatively low cost a curriculum if it's something you choose to do. And so the final thing we wanna briefly talk about before opening up for discussion are in, in whatever way in which we're trying to help our residents and our patients with behavior change, just some maybe good reminders. It's kind of a bit of a summary um, before we have discussion. One of them is the idea of this long-term perspective, that whole idea we talk about all the time of marathon, not a sprint. Um, during COVID and other times, you know, thinking about that behavior change is hard. If it were easy, they wouldn't need us. They wouldn't need these handouts and things. Um, but really seeing our role is empowering, uh, focusing on and celebrating small changes. We know that even small changes can have a big impact on physical health, mental health, and things like that. And so look for the little things. Maintaining a spirit of hope um, is certainly important. Um, continued discussion across visits, having them bring the pamphlets back if they're able to, uh, encourage tracking such as sleep diaries. Uh, you'll see that prominently featured in our sleep session. Um, um, healthy eating, physical activity, of course, is a great thing to track. Lots of ways in which you can be using to track. And then as we've talked about repeatedly, encouraging patients to focus on their values. Why is this important? You know, I often hear, I wanna be able to play with my grandchildren. Uh, I wanna be able to walk my child down the aisle, you know, or whatever it may be for them, um, helping them really draw upon and leverage that as a purpose, as a reason to wanna to make changes. And remembering, you know, we, you know, I think back to some of our qualitative interviews, some of our patients said, um, no one else asked me about this. You know, it's kind of sensitive to ask about quitting smoking or alcohol. I'm like, I'm glad my doctor talked to me. This was the right place. This is why I'm here. Um, and, you know, primary care providers are trained to talk about drug, sex, and rock and roll. Let's talk about this other stuff too. Okay, these are tools that we're hopefully empowering them to do so in a, an effective way um, that they can feel more confident. And then the patients are going to sense it if they're more confident as well to open some of these dialogues. But remembering that most patients do want us to talk about these things. We can bring them up and um, we can make a safe place to talk about these topics over time. Next slide. And Stephanie and I, there were our email addresses. Uh, we are both available for brief consultation. Uh, it's best easiest actually to reach us via email, um, but we are both available um, for today and afterwards if people wanna chat with us. And I would say um, we would love to hear from you in terms of what your thoughts or experiences are. Um, we do have a couple ideas of next steps um, and possible things that we're thinking about. One we've already kind of mentioned, and that is um, there seems to be, uh, some people have told us that they think this model could work for pediatric issues. Uh, Stephanie mentioned we are not pediatric psychologists, so it's not our expertise from the content, but things like screen time, um, um, you know, physical activity sorts of things could be modified to kids. Uh, a lot of different ideas um, could be possible. And so that's one thought is could some of this stuff be used in a pediatric sort of content. The second thing is, and we're actually really hopeful about this, we've learned that physicians like to learn best through videos. So these, you know, hour long PowerPoint things are nice and fine and good. But let's say I'm a you know, busy physician out in practice um, and really want to help know how to talk to my patients more effectively about you know, quitting smoking. If I could just go to this website and watch a five minute video of kind of an expert demonstrating the skill, it might be a much quicker way of learning or brushing up on a topic. So 
you know, they can't put my PowerPoint on two times speed, exactly. And so we've put in some grants. I don't really know if anybody knows of any money that could. We've got it all over now. We know what we're going to do. We've got the actors, got the videographer. We just need the money now to be able to do this. So we'll see. I don't know. Maybe next year we could tell you whether or not we're able to do this. But we think that'd be a nice addition to our website is to have some brief demonstration videos uh, showing how um, these things can be implemented. So um, those are kind of my thoughts. Steph, anything you want to add before we open up kind of for comments or further questions? Yeah, I will just say the other thing we're considering is kind of a larger scale implementation type study. And so, you know, thinking about implementing this in multiple residency programs and looking at, you know, how it affects resident behavior, you know, and, you know, and how they consult patients, but on the other side, like, do patients actually change? Um, you know, it's a, we've talked to a couple of different groups about how to, how to potentially do that, but it is a, a, a much bigger project that require a lot more funding. So it's on the horizon, hopefully, but, um, you know, if this is something that you feel like your residency program would love to participate in, like, feel free to contact us. We're just kind of trying to, you know, think about how to organize something like that too. Oh, I, um, uh, I'm sorry, I can't see Chris's last name. So I apologize, Dr. Chris, I, I can't see your last name. Um, but I had written, we have a community education requirement. I think this would be an amazing set of content for our residents to teach to a lay audience. We have to learn best by teaching. I couldn't agree with you more. Actually, it's so interesting. I've not even had a chance to uh, talk to Stephanie uh, about this yet. Um, but we're thinking we're moving, actually. Our clinic is moving. Um, and we're thinking of ways to connect with our community. And one thing we're thinking about is reaching out to houses of worship. If they might be interested in having kind of a Q&A or a brief topic. And this would be a perfect set of resources to, to make available and to use these as a, a community education. So I, I fully agree with you. I think it's a great point. So we've got about 10 minutes left. Let's kind of um, just stop here and see. Um, again, people have written lots of great things on, on the chat. We appreciate that. Other comments or questions or reactions? Yes. I have another. I have another question. I know that I've asked a couple of things already, so I apologize. Um, but this is a, around um, implementation. Um, one of the things that I have been working on as I've gone through the materials, which again I I, I think are really really terrific, is that most of the time that I have with residents in in my program is with residents individually. I mean, I do have didactic time, but like. I, I feel actually really lucky to have as much time as I have with working with individual residents because we, I, I, I feel like I've found ways to optimize and enhance teaching in that way um, and make it really individualized. Um, but then when, when I find resources like this that are um, like, um, that are, um, it, you know, emphasize the, the sort of the presentation modality, it, it, there's like a you know a step for me to transfer a lot of the the, the stuff which I have been doing. Um, I think the videos are a great idea for for that. To, but you know I guess it's a common data question is if you have recommendations for how to transfer what you already have into the sort of one on one teaching modality, or if not um, to to consider that as you think about expanding this um, in different ways to consider that there are those of us who um, do most of our teaching in a one to one format. That's a great point. And we haven't formally kind of translated our materials into like a one-to-one -one teaching format, but I, it was something that we would talk about with residents all the time in a one-to-one -one format. Like, um, you know, I think a lot of times residents will bring up like a specific skill that they're struggling with. Like, how do I help this person with smoking or with their sleep or something like that? And we would kind of walk through it with them. A lot of the times it would almost be like a role play with the two of us where they would still be the patient, the physician and we would be the patient and like, okay, like what would you say here, you know, and help them kind of coach. It's like a coaching style, essentially. We would translate. I don't necessarily think that the PowerPoints are essential to, you know, like translating the knowledge. I think the skills and like practicing the skills are essential. And so a lot of the times we would just encourage residents to keep trying it, like, you know, find a patient that you can work on this with and keep trying it, trying it out. Michelle, feel free to add. Yeah, no, I, I think they can look through the PowerPoint by themselves. They're pretty self-explanatory, actually, and there are speaker notes, you know, if they want to look at them. So if they want the content, um, they don't necessarily even need that from you. If they'll take the time during your rotation, whatever else to do that. And then 
you actually engage with them. What do you think of it? And how would this work? How would this not work? How would you problem solve and tweak it? So I think that's what brings it to life is actually the practicing. Um, and for us, if we don't give them the dedicated time during the action, whatever else to do it, they're so busy um, that they're not going to take the time to do it. So if you've got dedicated one-on-one -on -one time with them, that could perhaps be their homework or preparation for their time with you is to flip through those. You'll read the brochure, <laughs> take five minutes and read through the brochure and then let's talk about it. What would you think? Thanks, that's helpful. And congratulations, this is a really great work. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions people have? And do folks that we actually did present this at STFM um, and if you've noticed I've done a couple of serves and things. Any folks have ideas of other ways to share the resource of people you think or groups you think might be interested or might find it helpful? We'd love to either now or later if you have any other ideas. Um, once you create something, we'd love to share it with people and make it easily available. We also think about beyond family medicine. Um, would this be of use to internal medicine residents um, to you know, broaden, you know, fill in the blank. <laughs> uh, certainly um, many of these issues relate to a wide variety of topics, not just family medicine, but psychology in terms, I mean, there are social work, and there's so many things. So although our lens is family medicine, uh, I do CFHA, um, yeah, actually CFHA put it on, what was it called, Stephanie? Their share and learn or something? Like we just, they just contacted us like last week about it. I uh, forgot what the name of it is. Some kind of website they're planning to post it on. Uh, Division 38, that's a great idea. Yep, we reached, I did send it to the Div, Div 38 listserv. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, APHC, yeah, we, we shared it yeah, with APAC, the, Yep, APAC's a great idea. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, well, uh, if here's our time is about up, SBM, yeah, no, that's great, Dr. Brown, yeah, SBM, certainly. Um, maybe give people a couple minutes stretch break before their next session and thank you so much for coming it was lovely to connect with uh, many of you and um, really um, hear about some things that you're doing and um, we're honored that you chose to come and take time to spend with us today and hope that some of these resources might be helpful and keep us posted we love to hear how things are going and best wishes to all of you during this truly difficult time take, take good care of yourselves as we're taking care of each other so thanks for all you do thank you everyone have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Michelle, I'd love to download the chat if we could. That's what I'm trying to do right this moment. Okay. I don't know how. <laughs>